2022 was my best reading year yet and today I'm going to be going over my top 10 books of the year. Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Katie if you are new here and welcome to Katie's Book Nook. So 2022 was probably my best reading year yet. I read 160 books which is just insane to me. Actually one of my goals for 2023 is to maybe slow down on the reading and focus on longer maybe more fantasy books instead. So we'll see how that goes but if you have been around my channel for a while you'll notice that the shelves behind me look different. I have moved into a new apartment so you can look forward to a bookshelf tour from my last apartment, a reorganization for this apartment, and maybe another bookshelf tour to follow after the reorg video, but lots of exciting content coming out. And last year I really wasn't posting as consistently. I had been on booktube for like about five years now and I just felt really, really burnt out and I just needed to give myself some time to recuperate and now I feel like I have lots of ideas for the new year. I'm definitely feeling less burnt out and I'm excited to go back to post weekly. So that is my goal for 2023. I have read so many wonderful books this past year. It was really hard to narrow it down to the top 10 but I think I have my list solidified. Also I know that this video is maybe going up a little bit later than other people's top 10s have gone up but like I mentioned I was moving so didn't really have time to film this while I was in the middle of moving and I didn't want to film it before I moved because it still wasn't the end of the year and who knows I could have found a new favorite in that time. Okay let's work our way from 10 up to number one. I will say that this year I read a lot of different genres than the ones I've primarily read in the past. More so I've read a lot more like adult romance um but yet i still find that my favorites are like in the ya um an adult high fantasy category which is again why i'm kind of changing my goals to focus more on those kinds of books because i have accumulated a lot of them that i haven't read but rest assured i will still be reading romance i just want to make sure that i'm making goals that will help me read through my gigantic physical tbr all right, coming in at number 10, we have XOXO by Axie O. This book was just the most heartwarming experience to me. It just felt like a hug in a book. I actually do not read a lot of YA contemporary, um, but this book, this book just, just made me so warm and fuzzy inside. I also love the Naked Hardback, it's beautiful. I know Axie O also has a YA fantasy out that I really, really want to read. I think the cover is so beautiful. After her writing in this book, I definitely want to check out more by her. This is like a K-drama, K-pop based book. And if you don't know, I am obsessed with K-pop. So Jenny is a like world-class celloist and she is always practicing and working towards her goals really instead of choosing fun. However, one night, Jeyu comes into her uncle's Korean karaoke bar and they set out for a night of adventure. After that one night, he goes back to South Korea. However, Jenny ends up in South Korea with her mother a few months later to help care for her ailing grandmother. And who does she meet at her elite arts academy but Jeyu himself. And when she gets to the academy, she finds out that the stranger she spent a wonderful night with in Los Angeles turns out to be one of the most famous K-pop stars in the world. And if you know anything about K-pop, you know that it is very strict when it comes to idols dating and so he is not allowed to get wrapped up in a dating scandal with anyone. But yet they can't deny their feelings for each other. I just think that this was so beautiful and I loved both of their personal development. I loved it being set in the K-pop world but it also um, you know touches on some topics in K-pop if you are a person that is involved in consuming K-pop content that is kind of can be difficult to wrap your head around like dating bands, dating scandals, and whatnot. Um, but I just thought that this was so, so cute and adorable and I loved every second. You get to see Jenny as she really comes out of her shell in South Korea and instead of being so honed in on her cello, she, you know, makes friends and tries to navigate her life in a different country. And I just thought both of their character development was amazing and they were so cute together and I just, I love this book. At number nine, we have the Caraval series. So I'm counting this whole series in one spot because I kind of view it as like a whole entity. Um, I have a whole reading vlog dedicated to reading the series for the first time. I buddy read them with Keely, my BFF. So please go check that out. Um, but yeah, I love these and I was definitely swept away. So we have Caraval, Legendary, and Finale. 
I will say I think Finale was my favorite of them because it just really brought the series to such an amazing conclusion and I think that it was just so well done. Each book really upped the ante. However, let me tell you what the Carvel series is about. So Scarlet and Tella Dragna have never left the tiny island that they're from and they live with their father who kind of rules over them with an iron fist. However, she's always dreamed of going to Carvel, which is this magic carnival game that is invite only and is full of magic and whimsy and she's grown up hearing about it from her grandmother. However, this year, Scarlett's long-awaited dream arrives and she and her sister are invited to Caraval. And with the help of a mysterious sailor, Tella whisks them away to participate in this game. However, once they arrive, Tella is kidnapped by the mastermind behind Caraval legend and she is the prize for winning the game this year. Everything during Carval is supposed to be a game, but Scarlet embarks on a journey of love, betrayal, and magic. I have to say, I think the strongest part of the series is definitely the setting. I think Stephanie Garber just so eloquently describes the settings and it really feels like you're in this game and the game was fast paced and it was just so enchanting to be wrapped up in this story and I just love my experience reading this entire series. This first one follows Scarlet. The second one follows Tella, and then the third one has both of their POVs. Um, and I think that really in this second book, Legendary, Stephanie Garber was able to really expand the world. She expanded the lore of the world. She just really added layers and layers to the story. And I think it really is why this third book stands out because so much was layered upon the first story and the second story and made it even better. And I just feel like Stephanie Garber's writing improved throughout the entire series. And this is her debut series. So it's really nice to see that um, you can actually see her growth as a writer. But overall, just like such a wondrous, enchanting, whimsical, magical, yet heart pounding series. Coming in at number eight, we have Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan. Um, and then this is also the Waterstones edition that I have, which I just think is so pretty. I love the UK cover, but those edges, I know the fairy loot one even has like more on the sprayed edges, but yeah, I just, I saw this for a bargain deal and I had to grab it. Also, if you look at the sequel, Heart of the Sun Warrior, the fuchsia edges. Have I read that yet? No, but I will get to it. Alas, okay. Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan. This is an adult fantasy book. Just absolutely so eloquent and beautiful. This story is inspired by the Chinese legend of Chang'e, the goddess of the moon. Xin Ying grows up on the moon as the daughter of Chang'e, and she has to be hidden from the celestial empire who banished her mother to the moon. But when Xingyi's magic flares and she is discovered, she is forced to flee from home. Then flees to the Celestial Empire and takes on a new identity and has to really fend for herself and she ends up in a position where she is training along the Emperor's son. And from there she really goes on a quest to save her mother. And this book was just so beautiful. It really felt like an epic journey through Xingyi's life because it is the kind of story that takes place over like a long period of time. So we really see how she has gone throughout like her whole, I don't want to say her whole life, but like a long chunk of time for like, we see the beginning where she's like on the moon. And then when she really is like growing up, trying to blend into the celestial empire. And then like later on when she goes on some of these missions. So I, I liked that the scope of this book was um, a lot larger than we normally see in YA fantasy and it definitely, I mean it is an adult fantasy, right? So transitioning to that more epic, longer, long form storytelling. Um, but it was just full of such beautiful imagery. I'm so entranced by just the story of like mother-daughter love and really just trying to forge your own identity and find your place in the world. There's also dragons and I love a good dragon story and I just think this book is worth the read if you were thinking of reading it. I mean look at how gorgeous this cover is and I absolutely cannot wait to start reading the sequel which I almost feel like maybe, maybe I should reread this. I don't know because I just have such warm and fuzzy feelings when I think of this book. In number seven, we have This Vicious Grace by Emily Thierde. And oh my gosh, it's a little lemon. I actually think for this month, I had done a lemon spread in my bullet journal. Also, I'm thinking of posting a bullet journal flip through. Would anyone be interested in watching? Um, because I, I do my bullet journal. I don't post it on YouTube, but I could do a flip through, you know, for the end of the year. Anyways, um, this was when I was getting into like aesthetic tabbing. So instead of using my regular annotation system, I just did the um, 
yellow and the green under quotes that I liked and I just feel like it matches really well and I like that a lot. I can't necessarily do that for like every book that I read but I enjoyed it. This was almost described as like a YA fantasy like kind of rom-com and I would it kind of had like that a little bit of that uh feel to it but not totally um it's on an island that's kind of based on italy and sicily but there are people of all different ethnicities here it's not just like time people because it is a fantasy world so i really actually appreciated that element i thought that that was very well done alessa has a gift from a god that makes her the finestra which basically means that she can amplify the power of her partner um, which is important because on this island of regeneration there is a demon sworn and the Fenestra and her partner have to fight off the demon spawns. Ever since her powers were discovered she is kind of cloistered in this convent and they are trying to find her partner. However, she's had three weddings and three funerals because she kills every person that she tries to work with. And so there is a fanatic priest and he convinces the whole island that the only way to stop the oncoming plague is to kill her. So Alessa hires an outcast bodyguard and you know, tries to keep herself from being murdered. But as their feelings grow, Dante's dark secrets might be what tears them apart. I just thought that this book was so well done from just like the the setting to, I was really intrigued with like the lore, the concept of like this demon plague that comes once every like 15 years or so. Um, Alessa being in this position of power, but only so that she can amplify another's power. So like, she's very important, but she doesn't have any power on her own, which was a very interesting theme. Um, breaking tradition and trying to come up with other ways to solve the problem, I thought was really well done. And just like the lore was so cool. Um, I think that this world has room to expand. It was kind of like hinted on and there's definitely gonna be another book and I just loved it. Loved the imagery, Alessa and Dante together. Loved them. Please, if you were thinking of reading this one, pick it up because it's just amazing. Okay, this next book was my favorite romance book of the year, coming in at number six. We have A Set on You by Amy Leah. I actually read this twice this year because that's how much I was obsessed with it. Crystal Chen is a half Chinese curvy fitness influencer who has built her career on shattering stereotypes in the gym. So after her most recent breakup, she just kind of finds solace in the gym. Enter Scott, a hunky firefighter, and he, you know, routinely steals her favorite squat rack. And they basically, you know, have a little bit of nemesis enemies going on here. There, there's a little bit of battling in the gym. And uh, so the last thing that they expect is to run into each other at their grandparents' engagement party. And so they are kind of thrust into each other's lives. Crystal discovers that there's a soft side underneath Scott's exterior. So I loved this. I feel like the relationship between Crystal and Scott was cute. There were a lot of spicy moments, but what really, really made me attached to this book is just Crystal's mindset and her feelings about her body, her feelings about fitness. She is a curvy, um, plus size fitness influencer, but she isn't trying to change her body. She just like really enjoys fitness for movement um, and really tries to be body positive. And you know, that kind of mindset is in this book and I just thought it was so beautifully well done and Crystal struggles with feeling like she has to be positive all the time for her followers and so she really kind of has this journey from body positivity to body neutrality and it just really struck a chord with me and at a time where I was feeling not great about myself I picked this book up again to reread it and it really just made me feel better and it kind of you know helped me work through some of like the body positivity, body neutrality things I was thinking about in my own head. And so I really love this book for this one. But also, it's spicy. There's a gym spicy scene. Scott is a hot firefighter based off of Chris Evans. And um, they also go to my favorite Italian restaurant because it's in Boston, Mama Maria's. If you're ever in Boston, go eat there. It's expensive, but it's worth it. Okay, so coming in at number five is a book I read late in the year, so I'm glad that I waited all the way to the end of the year to, before I made this video, but that is Once Upon a Broken Heart and The Ballad of Never After by Stephanie Garber. These are the Barnes & Noble exclusive editions. Um, as obsessed as I was with Carval, these books just took it to another, another level for me. Like, these are my favorites from her. Once Upon a Broken Heart follows Jax, who is the Prince of Hearts. We meet him in the Carval trilogy. I think that you should read the Carval trilogy before you read these books because otherwise you're missing out on some really important character development for Jax and important backstory. 
but anyways so this takes place after the carvel trilogy has ended and we follow evangeline fox and the boy she loves is about to marry her stepsister and she knows that the prince of hearts will make deals and so she goes to make a deal to stop the wedding and he says sure but in return you will owe me three kisses and <laughs> Things spiral out of control from there. Um, I just think that the story has so much depth than what you first go into it expecting and I, as much as I love the settings and everything in the Carvel trilogy, this just took it to another level of whimsy, enchanting, magical, like I want to live in the magnificent north. I want to live there. Even if it's like kind of scary, like it's still, it's cool. Like we are introduced to some new creatures and the myths, the legends, like it is just wild. Like there are so many twists and turns. I was, my heart was pounding. I was kept on the edge of my seat. I just adored these. The ending of this book literally ripped my heart and my soul out of my body. I will be waiting until September to <laughs> figure out what's gonna happen because I have strong feelings about Evangeline and Jax. I love them together. Evangeline is such like this bright, optimistic, um, almost bordering on naive character that we don't see a lot in YA fantasies. And I just like loved her her take on the world and how she's always optimistic and always thinks that things are going to work out. And then we have Jax who's like this broody, you know, semi-god and <laughs> he like is kind of like a little bit of a slippery, mischievous trickster and you never know like what is exactly going on with him and that intrigue and just his character. Like he's a guy that like you think you should hate but you also kind of love him and like they're just so unique. Uh, that I think they're very unique in their characterization and I just love them together, the fan art of them. I just stare at it incessantly like <sighs> the series holds a special place in my heart. Next up in spot number four is Saturday Mass House of Breath, Sky and Breath. Honestly, all of these books and like my top five, it was really kind of hard to, to rank them. I loved Crescent City number one, which is House of Earth and Blood. And then this book just took it to new levels. You know, I was excited for it. It's Sarah J Mass. I don't know if I need to say anything more than that, but um, it almost feels like I didn't even realize that I read this book this year because it feels like it was so long ago. But in Crescent City, we follow Bryce Quinlan, who is half fae, and she's living in this like brawling metropolis um, where all different sorts of creatures live. You have like angels, fae, vampires, mermaids, like anything you can think of, they all live in the city together. And it's ultra modern um but it's still set in a fantasy world and basically she's like this party girl you know she works in an art gallery and she she parties it up at night with her best friend Danica um however that all changes when Danica is brutally murdered and she kind of like becomes a shell of herself a few years later Hunt Athlar is an angel who are kind of like the governing body and he is assigned to look into the murder of Danica and since Bryce was one of the witnesses they need to kind of work together and figure out what is going on and they become closer from there but of course it's Sarah J Mass and there's so much more than meets the eye. I feel like we learned a lot of things in this book, went to unexpected places. Obviously I loved it, it was kind of at the edge of my seat. It's Sarah J Mass. I love her and I, things are connecting. I mean the ending, the ending of this, like you know the ending of this book, like whew. I need Crescent City 3 information because I'm going to cry otherwise. In number 3 we have Dreams Lie Beneath by Rebecca Ross. Um, again, this is one where I tried to match the tab color. I just had these like teal tabs that I used. Let's see. And I have this like teal pen. So every new moon, um, magic can escape from dreams and the wardens are the only ones that can keep that magic from wreaking havoc. So Clementine wants to follow in her father's footsteps and become the warden of their territory, even though she yearns to study the wilder side of magic. However, her father's domain is challenged by two other magicians from a different territory and she gets drawn into a centuries old conflict. I mean, I love anything with dream magic and I just thought that this was so captivating and beautiful. Just a very enchanting story. I loved Clementine and her character development and I mean, look at this cover. One of my favorite covers of the year, I think. Like, the thing I love most about Rebecca Ross's writing is that her writing is just so beautiful. Like, this is just such a beautiful story and has left a lasting impression on me. It's just about, like, dreams, vengeance, family, curses. If you are looking for a really beautiful standalone fantasy, 
I would highly suggest picking this one up. On to number two, we have Kingdom of the Feared by Carrie Maniscalco. This series has been on my top list for the past few years with each of the former books, so no surprise that this one ended up here. This took the story to places that I did not even imagine and I think wrapped everything up so beautifully. So in Kingdom of the Wicked, which is the first book, we follow Amelia and her twin sister Vittoria. And Amelia just lives on the island of Sicily with her family running their restaurant. And they are strege, aka witches. And Amelia's life is turned upside down when her twin sister is brutally murdered. And so she is thrown into her grief, she is bereft, and she will do anything to figure out what happened to her sister and enact her vengeance. And enter Wrath, who she accidentally summons, he is a prince of hell. And so he has um, a mission to find a bride for the devil, and so they can kind of, you know, help each other because all of the people that have been murdered, including Victoria, were potential brides. So they embark on a mission together. and. I did not see where this story was going to go. The things that we found out, I was shocked to say the least. Um, it gets my, this book goes full on adult. It is spicy. I have the spicy scenes tabbed at the top because that's what you gotta do for easy access, you know? Um, I love Amelia and Wrath together. Like, I love them so much. Their relationship development. I just love that Amelia is driven by anger and she's not afraid to be angry, to deal with those difficult emotions and really lets them fuel her and that obviously matches well with Wrath, whose sin is Wrath. Um, and this world was really, really cool. You know, my pers my whole perspective on it was changed in this third book, but I loved also exploring the other realms of hell um, with the other princes. And now Carrie Maniscalco is doing an adult book for each prince, I'm pretty sure. So I'm so excited. So the next one's gonna follow Prince Envy, who we have met in the series and I just can't wait. I'm, uh, it was so fun to try and piece together what was happening throughout the course of the series and figure it out at the end and uh, I just feel like it just came together in such a satisfying and beautiful way and I'm sad to see the series end because I just love it so much. But it's not really ending because we're getting more books in the world. And drum roll please, my number one book of the year, Belladonna by Adeline Grace. I, lo I, I loved this book so much. So I knew that I was going to love this book like before I picked it up because of the cover, but then I read it and I was like, wow, like I extra really love this book. Signa was orphaned as a baby and passed around from family to family. However, each of her guardians has met an untimely end. The only family she has left are an eccentric bunch known as the Hawthorns who live in an estate called Thorn Grove, which is very glittering and gr gloomy. Its patriarch mourns his late wife through a wild party thrown at the estate. The daughter suffers from the same ailment that killed the wife and the son is kind of trying to hold the family together. However, the mother's restless spirit arrives to Sigma and tells her that she was poisoned and now Sigma must figure out what has gone on and her best chance is allying herself with Death who she has been able to see and communicate with her whole entire life. And they have a growing connection. Sigma and Death, um, I love them. The romance, the romance was so good, it was so well developed but there's also uh, like this book is just so beautifully written and it has like this gothic setting where at one part it's like balls like Bridgerton but then she's also in a romance with death um, and there's just like poison going on and spirits and communicating with the spirit of death and like I just thought it was so beautifully executed so well done and like it, this just book has just left a lasting impression on me like there are so many quotes that just like really touched me and I just thought we're so so gorgeous and I just love this book so much it had some twists and turns that I wasn't expecting and like I just like I just love it like I mean look at it like this is it for me and the next book Foxglove comes out in August and I absolutely can't wait because this book wrapped up nicely but also was left pretty open-endedly and I can't wait to see where it goes but yeah I just think that the writing is just so beautiful and the story is so beautiful and has this really interesting mix of like dark but like aristocratic gloomy and glittering and I just love it so much. So there you have it guys my top 10 books of the year. I think it was a really solid reading year and I just even talking about these books now like I just get so happy with how much I loved 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 these books. So please let me know down below in the comments if you have read any of these books and what you thought of them and have some fun read some books and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye!